Hello and welcome to tonight's event, Uncounted, the History and Impact of Voter Suppression. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Asia Lara. I'm a program manager here at Humanities Washington. We're a nonprofit organization whose mission is to open minds and bridge divides by creating spaces to explore different perspectives. We at Humanities Washington acknowledge that we present this program from the traditional and occupied lands of the Coast Salish peoples. We ask for those participating in this event, wherever they may be, to reflect on the lands they inhabit and to acknowledge the ancestral and traditional territories of Indigenous peoples. This event is part of Humanities Washington's Rebuilding Democracy Initiative, a deep dive into the state of democracy, voting, and civic engagement that is presented in partnership with stations KUOW, KPBX, and Northwest Public Broadcasting. It is produced with the support of the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative, administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We thank them for their contributions. We also have several upcoming Speakers Bureau events, so please check out our calendar at humanities.org to register for talks on such topics as the ethics of climate change and historic weather in the Evergreen State. If you're interested in programs like these, please consider donating through our website. Before we begin, please note that this is a recorded event. Tonight, our panelists will be taking questions following the discussion. Please submit your questions at any point through the Q&A box. Our goal at Humanities Washington is to create space where we can have important conversations in a civil manner. Harassment or otherwise inappropriate behavior will, resor will result in removal from the event. We are in different places with different circumstances and different beliefs, but even so, tonight we are together and contemplating the same questions. With this in mind, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Johan Neem is a professor of history at Western Washington University and the author of two books on education, the most recent of which is titled, What's the Point of College? I'm proud to say that he's also a member of our Speakers Bureau program presenting a talk titled, What Happened to America's Public Schools? So without further ado, please take it away, Johan. Thanks, Asia. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, my job is just to be moderator, so my hope is that we start a conversation and that you don't hear much from me for a while, um, because everyone here has so many interesting things to say. I want to thank all the panelists for being here, um, and I'm just going to ask everyone to introduce themselves very quickly. I want to start with Representative Deborah Lakanoff, who represents the 40th Legislative District in Washington State and has honored us with our, her presence at a very busy time. And so thank you for being here. Do you mind introducing yourself briefly? And, and then we'll, the others will as well. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, uh, Humanities of Washington. And it's a privilege and an honor to be sitting with these incredible panelists here today. My Slinket name is Hikchisi. It comes from the shorelines and the waterlines of uh, a small town located in Southeast Alaska. It's my honor to come into my second term in serving in the House of Representatives as uh, the 40th LD, in the 40th LD. I am the, currently the only Native American to serve in the Washington State Legislature. I walk behind the footsteps of four other Native Americans who served before me. Today, we are talking about an important topic that is opening the door for many who have called this place home and whose ancestors who have called this place home since time immemorial. So thank you for having me here. Thank you. Angelique Davis, do you want to introduce yourself next? Would you mind? Yes, hello everyone. My name's Angelique Davis. I'm an associate professor of political science and African and African-American studies at Seattle University. I'm excited to be here today. My research has focused uh, the last few years primarily on how we can make invisible racism visible. And so I've spent some time and I'm looking forward to this discussion today and looking at the narratives and the different tropes that have been used regarding voter suppression. So thanks. Thank you. Josue? Josue, I don't think we can hear you. Other panelists, are you hearing Josue? No. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Josue, I'm, we can't hear you at this moment. I'm gonna ask Terry to introduce yourself and we'll come back to you, um, okay. if you don't mind. 
Sure, absolutely. Hi, I'm Terri Ann Scott. I am an Associate Professor of History and Director of African American Studies at Hood College in Maryland. Previous to being here, I taught at the University of Washington, and my research and teacher, teaching interests focus uh, largely on social violence, um, lynching, um, social movements, as well as the intersection of race and sports. And I'm the resident historian for actually a Seattle-based organization called Project Pilgrimage, in which we take deep dives into issues such as those that we're going to be talking about today and take a group of interracial and intergenerational people through the South on a civil rights journey to explore issues of voting and, and Jim Crow and, and voting suppression. And it's really wonderful to be here. I echo what other panelists have said. Thank you so much. Thanks, Terry. What's way that's, are you, you're currently muted. Hello, hello. Perfect. Uh, wonderful. Yay. <laughs> uh, you know, we think we got the technology figured out <laughs> working on that. It's a quite an honor to be part of this panel here. Uh, my name is Josue Estrada. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of History at the University of Washington. And my deal, my research deals with a number of issues uh, Latino people face in the United States, uh, notably the problem of voter suppression, the challenge of political mobilization, and also the complicated uh, racial categorization of Latinos in law and social practice. Uh, and I'm also a director of a federally funded program at Central Washington University called Gear Up. Thanks, Josue. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you all to all the people in the audience. Um, uncounted is a theme. And if, if you read the blurb for this event, you know that it starts out that this year, 160 bills have been introduced in 33 states to restrict voting four times as many as during the same period in 2020. So we're in a moment where, where there's a lot of political movement around limiting access to the vote. Um, and so it's, we're, at a, we're at a very kind of distinctive moment in the history of our democracy. And all of you who are here on, or, or as panelists have studied voter suppression in different contexts and have some knowledge about what's happening in our state as well. And so I guess my first question, just to start the conversation is, in your work, what did you learn about voter suppression? What it looks like? What surprised you about it? And, you know, and, and, and help us start to see what we're talking about here. And Deborah, if you, want to, if you want to start us off, that would be great. Thank you, I'd be happy to. You know, um, in my fresh, freshman year coming into the state legislature, one of the biggest conversations we were having with the 29 federally recognized tribes in Washington state was how do we remove the barriers and how do we overcome the suppression that's, that we have faced, not only in our Native American communities, but in our vulnerable communities in our communities of color. Uh, for me in Washington state, it was very clear that we needed to uplift the excitement to vote. We needed to educate our, our communities of color and our Native American communities, and we needed to own that voice uh, to vote. Um, we worked very hard on uh, voting rights across Washington state before I got there as a freshman uh, three years ago, but then also even today. The Washington State Voting Rights Act, you know, was modeled underneath the Voting Rights Act. The Native American Voting Rights Act was just so simple as uh, those who didn't have an address to be able to go and get their voting ballot and their ballots at the tribal office, to be able to put a, 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 a ballot box on the reservation next to the tribal office was enormous. I mean, many of you have been there with your aunties and your uncle watching them fill out their ballot. Imagine a little kindergartner, second grader reading the ballot to their grandma and helping them fill it out and then walking hand in hand down to the reservation trail, down to the the tribal offices and delivering your your voting uh, your voting ballot. You know, it's an exciting time in Washington State to see this time evolve. You know, we did exciting things underneath um, the uh, state and local government, such as prepaid postage. Who would have ever known how much that would have removed barriers uh, for our our voters? You know, expanding access to voters with disabilities service voters and voters overseas. You know, we saw Representative Mossbrooker uh, who comes out of the Yakima uh, area uh, talking on the Senate in a Senate committee about making sure that our voter pamphlets went overseas. 
that was just an exciting moment. I think, you know, our democracy and our state are best when we elect leaders also who look like us and represent our communities. Being the only Native American serving the state legislature, I don't feel as if I'm alone. I look to the left of the People's House and I look to the right of the People's House. Both my Republican and Democratic parties are rising up and taking responsibility for reaching out to my Native American communities and knowing there's a responsibility there to remove barriers. At the end of the day, if you vote, you vote. You take ownership to your future. And so I'm excited to be able to work and share even more in our dialogue today, um, some of the work and some of the bills that we're passing this year. But that's a little bit of uh, my past and what I've witnessed and been part of in the last three years. Thank you so much. Terry, would you like to jump in next? Sure, you asked um, kind of what has been surprising. I wouldn't say necessarily that I've seen things that are surprising, but what I would note is that observations as of late um, demonstrate the connections, the historical connections between voter suppression of the past as well as that that occurs today. For instance, if we think about it historically in terms of reconstruction, many of us know that during the reconstruction period, we see um, obviously unprecedented because previous to that, most African-Americans were enslaved, so unprecedented black political power where African-Americans were elected to public office by the number of nearly 2,000. And so once you have the end of reconstruction and the removal of union troops who are overseeing these elections in the South, then you have this backlash against what was referred to for decades as Negro domination. And so a resistance to Negro domination was the rise of these kinds of voter suppression things things such as what are typically called facially neutral laws. So that in the language of the law, they don't say, I'm going to, for instance, give a literacy test to a black person. They give it to all people, but in the way that they are applied, they become very much something that serves to disenfranchise black people. A white person may be asked to simply interpret one sentence of the constitution, whereas a black person would be asked to interpret an entire piece and the white registrar would say, you don't qualify. We see that same historical parallel now. So in the age of this kind of post Obama era and when we have this rise of, of power among black and brown people in local office and federal office, then we see the same kind of voter suppression uh, acts coming before us today. Again, facially neutral. The law in Georgia, for instance, that they are trying to pass to cut early voting. In the language of the law, it doesn't say we wanna stop black Georgians from voting but in the application of it, we know that the vast majority of people who take part in early voting are Black people going after church. And so these historical parallels of these kinds of laws where somebody could say, well, no, we're going to apply this to everybody. Oh, well, that seems okay. No, they are discriminatory in their face. And so that's the thing that we have to understand and educate people on. Thanks, Terry. That actually connects, Angelique, I'm going to ask you because you've, you've been getting a lot of press lately for your article on racial gaslighting. And it seems like this notion of this area of language and neutrality is somewhere you've been thinking a lot about. Yes, absolutely. And it really um, definitely can build on Terry's comment. Um, so my work, if you really take what she was talking about and thinking about it at a, at a really macro level as well in the narratives that we use, right? And the ways in which politically, right? racism, and we know, and socio-historically has always been there, right? But the way in which it manifests itself changes based on our socio-historical context. And so when, um, you know, we think about our, our previous uh, chief executive, right, who was frequently called the gaslighter in chief, you know, prior to that time, I'd already started doing some work where we were theorizing the concept of racial gaslighting. So putting the concept of gaslighting in a critical race theory context, where we were talking about with my co-author Rose Ernst about the political, social, economic, and cultural processes. So the things that are all coming together in our society that perpetuate and normalize a white supremacist reality, a reality through pathologizing people who resist or who speak out. And those are really premised in many ways on things that we call racial spectacles, which are these narratives that hide this ideology. And this white supremacist state power structure. And I want to be really clear when I'm talking about whiteness and white supremacy, right? I think most of us, you know, are at this point now where we understand it's an ideology, it's a structure. We're not talking about people who are necessarily, right, wearing 
hoods, right, in the Ku Klux Klan. So I want to be really clear. It's a way of looking at viewing the world and normalizing and centering whiteness. And so, you know, with my research and building on what was said already, um, you know, I really like to think about um, voter suppression in many ways. And some of the work I've done is almost like this Hydra headed beast, right? That as soon as you cut off one of its heads, two grow back, right? And then there's this one that's immortal. And so that it keeps changing over time. And so the language now, right, of voter integrity is nothing new, right? This language has been here for some time. Um, and right, it really predates the big lie, right, from the 2020 election, and it predates this plethora of voter integrity laws, and it even predates the 2013 Shelby versus Holder decision, right, where they talked about, well, you know, we know there's still discrimination in voting, but we're closer to vo voter parity, so we don't need to worry so much about this preclearance. And so, um, yeah, really thinking about the language that's being used. And so when you listen to Governor Abbott in Texas, like recently, you listen to, right, the language that's being used, it is definitely a form of what we would also call dog whistle politics, right, that's really signaling to certain people, because we know, right, that when they're talking about these urban centers, Detroit, Philadelphia, Atlanta, et cetera, right, what are they signaling? Well, they're signaling black and brown people, right, voting. Thank you. Yeah. I think this connects, Josue, with your work because you are, you've are you been studying the origins of the Latina, Latino voting rights movement, including here in Washington. And one of the things that Deborah said that it's interesting that I think there's two parts to voter suppression. One is the different modes of suppression and how we find out strategies of suppressing the vote. But Deborah used the phrase of exciting people to vote and that there's a way in which people can claim the vote. And that seems to connect with some of the things you've been talking about, that there's suppression, but there's also things that people who are, who are finding their vote limited can do. So I wonder if you would talk a little bit about what you found. Yeah, so what I look at is, how is it that um, Latinos, particularly Puerto Ricans, and also Chicanos uh, built political leverage to enter the voting rights debate? Um, and also, how is it that uh, they argued that these folks were also being targets of racial discrimination. And they use race very uh, strategically to claim voting rights, right? I think uh, Terry and Angelique are getting to this ish idea of uh, color blindness that is within these laws to suppress the, the vote. And English literacy tests were one of those laws. You know, they were supposedly administered fairly equitably, but we know that in the South, they were absolutely used to uh, limit and restrict Black people from exercising the ballot. Now, I find it fascinating. You know, I, I've, I've been doing a lot of research on the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It's a significant legislation. I'll just give three points, right? It, uh, it added some teeth be behind the, the 14th and the, uh, the 15th Amendment that race couldn't be used to uh, disenfranchise voters. It suspended literacy tests. Um, it also prohibited uh, new laws from coming into place without a preclearance measure, right? And then it also allowed federal examiners to go into the South, you know, and make sure elections were fair. Uh, now the debate leading into uh, the Voting Rights Act is fascinating, right? Because in the South, you have these states that are saying, no, our tests are fair, our, our tests are e equitable. But in the Northern states, those states that have literacy tests in place, uh, they're saying, uh, well, you all in the South are absolutely using race to discriminate voters. Us in the North, no, we don't have an issue. We administer fairly, equitably, uh, mm -hmm. when that was absolutely not the case. Puerto Ricans uh, in New York City are gonna say, hey, this test here is being used to disenfranchise me. And at the same time, they're also poking holes at American citizenship. And they're saying, hold on a second, uh, this idea that uh, 
I'm supposed to be an equitable citizen just as another white person is not the case. I'm actually experiencing an unequal level of citizenship. You're actually forcing me to take this English literacy test when it was never, when uh, citizenship was actually enforced upon Puerto Rican people. And for Chicanos and Mexican Americans here in, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit more complex because voting, the Voting Rights Act is going to suspend those literacy tests in the South. It's not going to suspend them here in Washington State and in Yakima County. Uh, they're going to be used to disenfranchise uh, Latino voters, and that's going to mobilize people to work to enforce the Voting Rights Act in Washington State. And also, they're going to develop tactics uh, to ensure that their particular needs are addressed. Can I? Make a point to, to the, I think the point that you're making about this idea of not having Southern exceptionalism is really important because I think historically and today it's very easy for people to look and say, well, that's what happened in the former Confederacy. That's what happened down there. And we have to understand that those kinds of tactics, as you pointed out, existed in other spaces and that it required sanctioning from the federal government to exist. There were a series of court cases that went before the Supreme Court, like in 1898, Williams versus Mississippi, that, sa that said, oh, it's okay. You can continue to have a literacy test and a poll tax and all of these kinds of things. And so this is a national problem. This was not just a Southern problem. So, so we, have a, we have a lot of, you know, in Zoom, we don't, people can come from all over. We have a, you know, widespread group of people, but, but a lot of the people who are listening are from Washington, um, from Washington State. What does it look like here? What's the story here? Because we do have this kind of image of a kind of blatant Jim Crow segregation version of voter suppression. What do, how do we start thinking about Washington State and how, and how to identify what voter suppression might look like without beyond Southern exceptionalism? You know, I'll, I'll pop, I wanna feed a little bit off of what Terry was saying. It's like, you're right, Terry, it's, it's not just uh, an issue for down in the South. You know, mm -hmm. you talk about the first Americans, the Native Americans, this is our country. This is where our bloods, our roots, our names, this is our people. Um, when the U.S., uh, when the U.S., when the U.S. has ratified its constitution in what, 1788, it wasn't until 136 years after that Native Americans would be voting. So this just isn't an issue to, to the South or just one one color, it is, it is a brown color. If you're a different color, um, you know, when, when the black Americans won the citizenships of the 14th amendment in um, 1868, the government specifically in that law said it did not apply to native Americans. We would have to fight all up until the sixties and Utah was the last state in 1962 to allow native Americans to vote. And, and you would think, oh, well, you know, that was 1962. That wasn't so long ago. We saw in 2018 what the North Dakota Supreme Court did, where it would have taken away the Native American right to vote. So when we talk about Native suppression in Washington state, and, and you're right, uh, Johan, to be able to get us excited, we have been pushed down, squashed, told to go over to the other side of the river and vote in your own nation. You know, we've been told and pushed out. However, we're the number, we have the highest number of Native American veterans who have fought for this country. We have an enormous amount of investments of 29 tribes uplifting rural communities and employing them. But yet we are still facing just a simple fact of 2018 to put just a ballot box on the reservation so grandma can walk down with her granddaughter and teach her how to vote. So when we talk about is, is voter suppression live and well, it's alive and well. It is thriving still today. But for, for me, as the Native American in the state legislature, I have to overcome it, not be a victim, right? To my colleagues and my friends on the panelists, we're survivors. We are going to teach and educate, not forget the past, but evolve and create bills to eliminate barriers, um, to go into our communities of color and say, no longer are you going to allow people to make a decision for you. If you wanna make a difference, vote. If you wanna make a difference, run for office. If you wanna make a difference, make sure your language is being shared on the floor of the people's house. You know, I uh, 
you brought the passion out in me uh, to my my colleagues on the panel. You know, it it uh it is of all of us of one color that is a color of brown that we come out and we 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 advocate. We elect people who look like us and sound like us. We make decisions that impact our community. We incorporate and we define and we measure what equity and diversity is and not allow someone else. And removing mm -hmm. those barriers uh, to voting just allows uh, folks like me to serve and folks like your children's children to serve. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll pause there. Um, and uh, you woke me and I still, I stayed woke during that conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Deborah, I, I, I do want to add that here in Washington State, there was actually a law that said uh, Indians not tax could not vote here in Washington State. And that literacy test that was adopted here in, in our state, and I have it uh, written down here, uh, 1896, it just, it was targeted to, uh, certainly to Chinese people. There was a, a strong anti-Chinese sentiment here in Washington state, but it was actually also used to disenfranchise a number of indigenous people who, according to uh, the state literacy test, weren't able to, um, to read English or speak English and that disenfranchised them. And when that law was uh, written off the books in 1970, the Yakima Herald published an article of a, a native woman from Yakima registering for the first time to vote. It was a very powerful uh, image. Yeah, I also want to add, you know, in Washington state, and I think in several states, um, you know, we often think of the ways that we're you know, when we're talking today, particularly about these strategies, right, to limit people being able to uh, actually physically, you know, place their vote, however, through a, whatever modality that may be. But also things in Washington state, like our direct democracy process, like the initiative process and our referendum process that is focused on the majority has also historically excluded people of color, right? And even though, right, it's really been touted as this progressive era mechanism that really allows for people to participate, it's really, you know, was white male, property owners, right, and then uh, white males who were allowed to vote who were really pushing for this. And we know it really actually has this impact in many ways, as we saw with I-200 in our state and other things, with really a form of a tyranny of the majority. Like people want to say, well, this is a majoritarian process, but really what's happening then is those who, once again, are not as represented or don't have as large numerical numbers are then not also their vote and their political will suppressed. So I'm, I'm gonna just jump in here with a kind of silly question, but um, it seems to me in a democracy, we would want people to vote. Um, and something, you know, Deborah said earlier struck me that if people vote, and this was definitely true in the case of reconstruction as well, when people voted, then they not only have representation, I'm just thinking about, you know, building up your point, Angelique, they not only have representation, but people who want to get elected have to reach out to them, right? Whatever party you belong to, if you know some, a group of people is going to vote, you have to reach out to them. We're in, you know, 2021. Um, how, in a state like Washington in particular, but, you know, nationally too, how, how do people explain why the vote should be limited? Like, what are the grounds for limiting the vote? Um, like, often there's a racial subtext, but what is the text? How do how do people try to try to say we don't want to remove barriers, or worse, we want to impose barriers to make voting harder? How does that happen today? I think in some ways there. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Terry. Okay. So I was just going to say that I think that you said, uh, how do you kind of, I mean, the question is, how do you sell what you're trying to sell in some ways, right? And yeah. so there's one that is a sales pitch that is completely false that where the GOP, largely as we know, sells this notion that there is all kinds of voter fraud that is unproven, that out of 3 million, they'll have one case, so forth and so on. But we know what the subtext is, and the subtext is what all of us are getting at it is limiting, restricting, or removing the power of black and brown people. 
as my colleagues on the panel have already noted in, in very key spaces, it was all, these groups of people, our groups of people who pushed the election over to another, ed, to another uh, um, side. And so what happens is though, that people are so interested in disempowering people of color that they are willing to listen to the big lie. They're willing to allow this kind of Hitler-esque figure to say, oh, the vote was stolen from you because you are entitled to power based on a notion of privilege and white supremacy in many ways. And so they can sell that to those who buy into this notion of entitlement by saying we have to stop voter fraud. But in fact, that subtext is to disempower people of color and to make sure that this kind of, in many ways, white supremacist uh, uh, ideologies reign true and free and that they can govern without the input of others. No, I, I, I have to agree, Terry. I got excited too because I, uh, sitting in the, sitting as the vice chair in my house, my house committee on state and local government, I got the, the honor of being able to coordinate and collaborate with Representative Tara Simmons, who has newly come in as a freshman. And, you know, her bill, uh, House Bill 1078, uh, really is providing an opportunity to give back the, the voting right to those who've been incarcerated and those who've served their time and they're coming back into the community. Uh, we know that a majority of the people who are incarcerated are the people who look like us. Uh, it is our, they're low income, they've come from a place of disparity, there's something has happened, they've done their time, they want to come back into the community, they want to be part of the community, they want to be part of the world that um, they have not been for, for whatever reason they may, they may have not uh, gotten in trouble, but the uh, returning the opportunity to vote to our incarcerated was really a prime, uh, one of the top priorities of the House Democratic um, caucus and we were able to move that bill and what we believe and what we thought is for our people of color who and Native Americans make up a majority of that population in jail we're bringing them back into the community we're paying the dues that need to get uh, paid and we're returning them back into uh, giving back to the community what what they haven't been part of uh, to be engaged and be part of the community by voting um, really brings them back into society to be a productive uh, person within society. So that was also in one of the areas that I thought was uh, something that we should mention tonight. And I, and I wanted to raise my hands to Representative Simmons who lived and breathed this before she became an attorney coming out of, um, coming out of uh, being incarcerated. And then she stepped forward and said, let me, let me remove the barriers uh, to voting for all people of color and those who are being incarcerated because they are majority of those um, come from uh, low income and places of vulnerability and places of uh, people of color. You know, no, I'll I just, just add. Oh, I'll go after. Go ahead. Way. No, go ahead, Josue. I, I just really uh, wanted to add that, you know, um, in the past, you know, election laws were you know, passed through Congress, right? Supposedly with this idea that they were meant to pur purify elections and only allow these uh, well-informed voters uh, to access the ballot. I feel like that's almost, a, you know, you, you hear that, 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 that language when, when people mention, oh, there's this fraudulent voters that, that, that had access to the ba ballot as if these people were uh, not informed, not worthy to exercise the ballot. So I think there is a historical connection there where they use, uh, there's a segment of the population that uses this language to justify these unfair and racist election laws. Thank you. I wanted to add two pieces. I think the first thing is, you know, it was said by the GOP's attorney in the recent Supreme Court oral arguments um, regarding the Arizona uh, you know, measures. And, you know, he flat out said that this is politics is a zero sum game, right? So, you know, people want to say it's about access, you know, when we talk about democracy and access to the vote, right? 
I taught political science for many years, you know, the, the way people conceive of what is uh, a democratic system, what is democracy, right? There are very, there are many, many different ways of looking at that. And it really is, you know, I would say, particularly from the conservative right at this point, they're really looking at this and they are clearly playing to win, but they sanitize it in a way, right? In which it's much more palatable to certain people, right? Because most people, right? There's a number of people in our previous administration that didn't care if they were considered racist, but a lot of people do care or they do care if they are, you know, seen to be engaging in racist activity. And so, you know, this is a way to provide a cover for that, right? We're, we're not protecting, you know, we're not trying to prohibit. Um, I think the, you know, beginning of the oral argument before the Supreme Court was, we're not stopping people from being able to vote like we did with poll taxes or with literacy tests. We are now managing the integrity of the voting process, right? And so it's a distinction without a difference, but people get very much caught up in that language and that narrative, and particularly when it defines um, and allows them to remain comfortable, right? And so, you know, again, right, as much as we may see this as people of color who work in this area, there are a lot of people who are still because of the fact that they don't have to, right? We all know this, still very much in their own bubble, right? And so they hear these type of dog whistles of integrity. Oh, that's important, right? Um, and so now we need to really focus um, on this. And I think, you know, what is so amazing is how many people um, have fallen for this myth of voter fraud that has continued and continues to per be perpetuated in so, you know, over the years, over the decades in so many different ways, you know, um, there's a great quote from the Brennan Center's uh, Voting Rights and Elec uh, Elections Project that says, um, it's more likely that an American will be struck by lightning than they will impersonate another voter at the polls. And I think another one that really shows just the absurdity and the, the willingness people are to go to these great lengths to stay, um, comfortable, right, and, and not aware of what's really happening in their world. Um, there was a study in 2012 by political science at Stanford in the University of Wisconsin, and their study looking at um, voter suppression and uh, voter imperson impersonization um, concluded that the proportion of the pro uh, population who would impersonate someone at the polls is indistinguishable from that of uh, the number of people reporting abduction by extraterrestrials. So this is really how absurd this is. And if you look at the studies that consistently show what a lie and what a fraud this is, right? Um, you know, people are choosing to believe the lie. One of the things that's interesting that both Angelique, you said, and Terry, you said as well, is it suggests you both sort of turn to a kind of psychological explanation. You know, people today, for the most part, don't want to think of themselves as racist, right? That's, so that is, I mean, that's a form of progress, but that is, that's an important point. And so the methods to suppress the vote can't be as explicit, can't be as targeted as they might've been in the early 20th century, in the mid 20th century, certainly in the 19th century. Um, there's an older language coming out of the revolutionary period that Posue invokes, which has to do with capability to vote, right? Who is, they, there was a real fear that certain people won't be able to vote. And we see some of that about the kind of misled and harvested ballots. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the psychology. Like, it sounds like one of the reasons that voting suppression measures work is because it appeals or appeals to something about what, about people that is not explicit. Like, it's not their explicit, that it might've been 50 years ago. What is that thing you're referring to? You know, when I was, when I was speaking to um, uh, House Bill 1078 and we were talking about the lie, the big lie, um, you know, sitting in my local and state government, we we're moving a lot of uh, voter voting bills and the big lie um, that uh, we spoke about clearly exists for hours of debate on the floor of the people's house. 
and and it's not it's not just the lie and the fraud that's there, but it's almost as if we have the ability to determine whether or not you qualify to vote. Are you smart enough? Literacy, whether or not you're the right color to vote, you haven't earned that right. You're still someone else or go back to where you come from. But for that incarceration incarceration conversation, it was so unbelievably racist of how we have the privilege to say whether or not a person who's coming out of incarceration has the right to vote. The people who are coming out of incarceration were treated as if you were a rapist, you weren't allowed to vote. You were a murderer, you weren't allowed to vote. You robbed a store, you weren't allowed to vote. You got a parking ticket, you weren't allowed to vote. It, it became such a um, looking up and looking down at the people who and belittling them and creating such a state of uh, hierarchy and how decisions were being made that it, um, it was heartbreaking. And it was hours of debate and hours of racism that was on the floor of the people's house and within uh, local and state government that it made me, it, it makes you stop and say, we're still here. We're still having these conversations. Um, and the, uh, the opportunity we have is to take the good work of our professors and our researchers and to educate. We have to excite the people of the next generation to vote. We have to educate, we have to bring them there, we have to engage in it. Um, the fear and the fraud that's uh, being shared, it's a period of time which we'll have to overcome. And the only way we can do it is to do what Stacey Abrams done. We need to have started in November and been educated and getting into our people of colors communities and educating every, every day. And it's something I should have been doing, you know, in November myself. And it's something that we want to be able to continue to try and invest in. Absolutely. And, and I, I would add to that, I think when you're asking about the psychology, what is the psychology behind that? What are they trying to appeal to the GOP who are, who are um, creating and attempting to pass these laws? I think much of that psychology is white privilege and white entitlement. There's a notion that being um, that white and white entitlement should govern politics, should govern who can vote, which is why the laws are so clearly racist, which is why it was so easy for the last administration to turn large numbers of people, to turn uh, politicians against entire entities like Atlanta and Detroit and Philadelphia because of this idea that these people, these brown people shouldn't have determined the election. These other people should have. So that's much of the psychology behind that. Yeah, and, and a lot of this, just to build on this, right, is very classic um, ways in which racism has manifested itself over time, right? We think, you know, if I'm thinking politically and thinking about the concept of political spectacles, right, these are really narratives that are helping to politicize and polarize the public in a way that keeps them apprehensive at the same time that they're hopeful, okay? And so it's this strange balance, right? And so we hear, we see, and we know, right? So we, we are talking about white privilege, but you know, there's still a lot of issues even as we talk about that, right? We're talking about it in this structural sense. We're not talking about the individual white person who is struggling and who is not able to make ends meet, right? We're talking from a broader structural ideological level. And so, people are suffering, right? Across the board, across racial lines, people are having a hard time. And so when you're able to prey on the fears, right, that we're gonna be majority minority, right? That these people are, what were they ch uh, chanting in Charles, you know, Charleston, um, we're, you know, we're not gonna let them basically take over, right? Um, you know, that we need to maintain our, our way of life, our lifestyle, right? That is very much premised on the suffering of others, right? Whether people want to admit that or not, right? Their, their place in the hierarchy. And so, you know, this voter integrity, you know, and again, I am a political scientist, I, you know, study law and politics, not a psychologist, 
But when we're looking at the way these messages are done, right, we think about voter integrity on the one hand, right, there's these, like I've said before, these dog whistles that are signaling, right, oh, these problems, right, uh, and signaling black and brown people. But then the other hand, trying to keep people hopeful, well, we're going to have a better process, you know, it's going to be more integrous and all of these things, right. And so again, it's this whole narrative and story and myth. Angelique, you just uh, reminded me of uh, uh, Daniel Hosang Martinez's book. It's called The Ballot Propositions, and he writes about racial liberalism and the language that, he, that is used to put forth these laws, these propositions are all about, you know, they're, they don't use race at all, right? Uh, but they use this language, equality, liberty, uh, protection of, of voting rights, and then everyday or ordinary people look at these ballots and say, oh yeah, this is good for our voting process and they vote on, on that proposition. But the intent, the underlying message there is to deny, exclude, and certainly based on uh, white supremacy or, or, or those folks who, who want to uh, ensure that there is white dominance as, as well. Absolutely, and I want to add too that I think people get caught up in the fact that it needs to just be white people promulgating these messages, and that's not the case. When we look at our the the structure, the propaganda, the narratives that are going out, right, and whiteness is an ideology. In some ways, all of us that are part of this society are participating in it in, it in some way, and very frequently there are people of color, right, who will stand up and then we'll have somebody say, well, this person, you know, stood up. And so it can't be racist because they're trying to convince their community that this is for voter integrity, right? Or this is the right thing to do. Um, a woman named Sumi Cho, a scholar, she wrote about racial mascots and how often people of color have been used in ways um, to basically hold, you know, them up um, and to try to make this claim, right, that this isn't actually a structurally racist or ideologically racist action, right? And we know that it's not about necessarily the color of all of the people who are promulgating this because there's always going to be some people of color who are also, right, trying to also agree with these tactics. Um, there's also the ideology behind it. And I think and in listening to, to all of the things that, that we are all talking about and um, kind of beginning to deconstruct some of the laws and the ideas and what is going into them and to voter suppression, it can be very discouraging and no question upsetting and, and, and can be disillusioning. And I think one of the things that we have to remember is to fight against that, that history has also demonstrated while there are these historical parallels in the types and tactics um, and ideologies and, and motivations for voter suppression, we also know that it's been combated and that things like the 1965 Voting Rights Act that was brought about because of foot soldiers who got up every day and put one foot in front of the other and said, we're not going to allow this, that progress has been made, that new moral paradigms have been established. And so we have to remember that. We can look at what happened in Georgia. Georgia went blue. And so that is progress and progress can be made. And with that progress, there will be people who try to stop that. But we know that with these united efforts, with participatory democracy, with individual efforts, with the representative, like the one we have sitting here with us today, that we can combat those issues and that we can't give up. And we have to keep, just like those foot soldiers, putting one foot in front of the other and making sure that we affect change. We have a couple more minutes before we go to questions. I want to just build on that for a second. One of the things that that I guess I get that that stresses me out. I'll just put it in that way. Is about about the sort of moment we're in. I mean, a lot of the things stress me about the moment we're in. But but I want to build on. You know, it seems to me if people are having less faith, whoever they are, wherever they sit politically, racially, whatever that their vote matters, that the system is fair. That itself is a form of voter suppression. If you don't think that the system's working or that your vote will be counted or that, so in a sense, see, you know, seeding this doubt itself makes people less likely to vote. How do, 
how do we combat that? You know, you know, not just from a partisan perspective, but in a broader perspective, how do we combat this idea that the system is so broken it doesn't matter, or my vote will not count? These kind of softer forms of suppression that are not explicit tools, but are, but make people less likely to vote, even if they're able to vote, even if they, you know, even if the ballot box is near them, you know. Well, I think. I mean, I'll, I'll get excited here. I mean, we're, we're watching Kristen Harris Talley come in as a freshman and talk about ranked choice voting. You know, what a concept, a conversation that's been there. Thousands of people signing in to support it saying there's a conversation to be had here. Now the bill may not pass, but the conversation is being had and it's being risen up by a, a woman of color who comes out of an urban area that says, I need to make sure that our voice and our votes matter. Um, I think we need to get. I think we need to get excited. We need. We need to do what Stacey Abrahams has done. We need to make sure that everyone understands that your votes count. We have to remove the fear from our Latino ex and our Latino families and communities in Washington who are afraid to put their name on a piece of paper to vote because they don't want to be found. We've got to make sure the Native Americans aren't pushed down and told, and being thinking that their their country's been their land's been stripped from them. You don't matter. Stay on your reservation. Vote in your own. Vote in your own uh, elections. You know, when I was running for office, literally, I was told you cannot be native and you cannot be an American. You have to pick and choose. That was three years ago. Um, I I think the the rich history that uh, I'm I'm learning from my incredible professors and researchers here. We have to tell the history, but we have to build the future and change those laws. Every day we need to go into our community and say, your voice matters, you have to vote. You have to vote. You can complain, but don't be a complainer. Get off that couch and put one foot in front of the other, knock on the door next to your neighbor and said, don't forget to vote and educate yourselves because every voice matters. Um, it's, uh, it's going to be an incredibly heavy lift here in the next four years to maintain but we saw what happens when we don't show up to vote and we lived through a hellacious four years, a hellacious four years of, um, of just uh, disparity and hate and racism. And, and if we're gonna continue where we are today of hope, um, then we need to do what we're doing here today, elect people of color, get people of color out there to vote, share your voice, educate the next generation, pass laws, Get 16 year olds out there to get registered to vote. It's uh, it's going to be an uplifting time for us in the next four years. But if we're going to maintain it, we have to do what we're doing here today. Don't be afraid to have the conversation. Talk about the past, but live the future. Get people out there to vote every day, and I think we're going to be able to to be able to make that happen. Elect incredible people into the office. Um, it's uh, it's been monumental to watch the entire floor of the um, people's house. Uh, get woken up by the sound of voices, the look of color, all of the women, all of diversity and all of the culture. And we just need to continue to maintain that. I get excited, you guys. I'm just excited. To be <laughs> you should. Absolutely. And, and there's a culture that you can create in your communities. There's a culture that you can help create in your families, in your neighborhoods, where you understand that voting is your power. That is something that you can put forth. And one of the things, and I'm not above doing this, I do it all the time with my own children who are first time, I have twins who are 18, first time voters in the fall. And my students, I tell them, people have died for you to have the right to vote. So you owe it to others to make sure to take that precious gift and to use it properly and to never misuse it. You need to always do that. And it, it has worked with my children. They're in school in New York and they made sure to come down here and drive and cast their vote. and go right back, so. You know, I also want to add, so that's wonderful. I also want to add um, that we do, of course, need to talk about voting, it, crucially important, but we also need to know and recognize and remember that change doesn't come just through one tactic, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I, when I teach my students about politics, we talk about how change comes through both conventional forms of political participation, such as voting, right? And then unconventional forms of participation. And even with the vote, the way many of the structures are set up, right? There are a lot of reasons why people are very um, disillusioned with the way our system works. 
And so, you know, as communities, we, you know, and, and communities of color, the tactics that have made difference, there's always the inside and the outside game, right? And so, you know, we need to vote, we need to use those strategies, but if those things aren't working, then there's other ways of peaceful protest as well that can be used to garner, you know, political change and support. Thank you. I just want to add, you know, the, the, the importance of learning the history about voter, voter suppression, because that certainly has impacted people's uh, participation in politics. The other thing I want to add, it's, it's so crucial for local governments to create uh, a culture where voting is encouraged by everybody, you know, uh, th th that's crit critically important. Uh, there was uh, in 1968, the Mexican American Federation sued Yakima County to uh, eliminate its English literacy test. One person that was part of that, that, um, uh, that court case was Jenny Marin. Uh, her son was, uh, she was a US citizen. Her son was in the Navy. Uh, she wanted to vote for uh, Democratic presidential candidate Hubert Humphrey, right? And the city clerk there denied her the right to vote, ripped her registration card, threw it in, in, in the garbage there. Uh, she was upset and mad because after that law, after that English literacy test was wiped out, you know, she still had to go every every time to pay your water bill and meet that person there right and she was and she's the that that was that person that discouraged her did not allow her to vote and so it's so important that these local governments create a change in those communities that encourage that bring in latinos that bring in native american people that bring in african american people and encourage them to participate in uh, electoral politics Absolutely. oh it's so important it's so important oh my gosh like in the Skagit. In the Skagit, I have 40% uh, uh, Latino Hispanic community, right? 40% make up the Skagit was, was predominantly uh, one color, not so long ago, 20 years ago. Um, we projected by, um, by 2050, almost 80%, close to 80% will be, will, will be Latino Hispanic. So, right, uh, so I'm excited sitting down with this community who's championed me and supported me and said, let's, let's move. Let's get you into every elected position. Let's start training. Let's start educating. Let's get our local pamphlets. It's as simple as this. Get your local pamphlets into a language that really represents your county. And for me, it's the Latino community, the Latino Hispanic community, right? So our local governments need to embrace that and they need to be able to build that capacity to be able to have uh, voter pamphlets that are in a language that can be uh, used by the community members and not everything's by internet right you know not people still use papers people still like pamphlets they still like that little piece of paper with that pencil i mean we need to remove all barriers to get them to vote so um um i mean it's an it's it's a time for us to really take advantage of our communities of color and say we have an opportunity to manage and and move our, our, our policies and our laws at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, and why not do this now? And it takes reaching out, educating, and getting those materials forward. Thank you. I'll keep talking. You better stop yeah. me, Anna. Well, I think, I think Asia had some talking. questions from, from, from people who are listening in. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to her. Terry, I, I saw that you wanted to put one oh, more thing in. So I'll just uh, yeah, really I quickly, give... yeah. Is that okay? I just wanted to add on to something Anhalik said about uh, voting being one of several ways to engage in the political process. And she mentioned political protest, and that's key. We've seen with this past year of racial unrest, the people going into the streets across racial, across ethnic, across religious boundaries and coming together. And it is that kind of protest, the social media campaigns, the um, journalism that was a part of this. That has, for instance, brought to fruition the George Floyd Policing Act that is now in Congress. And so that is a kind of political change that will serve to protect people that one of the things I think that's part of it is eliminating the chokehold, for instance, that has been responsible for killing um, black and brown men in particular and women for decades. And so it is very important to understand that there are many ways to engage in that political process. Absolutely. 
Thank you so much, Terry. And thank you so much to all of our panelists and our wonderful moderator, Johan. Um, all right, at this point, I'd love to enter the Q&A portion of our event tonight. Um, a reminder to audience members, if you do have a question, please use that Q&A box to enter it. Um, let's see, to start off, let's see our first question. What can we on the West Coast do to counteract or blunt the effect of the draconian law changes in states like Arizona and Georgia? Aside from what Terry just, just mentioned. <laughs> You know, I think often people focus on the national elections and really, you know, reiterating how important our local, our state and local elections are, right? Because these are actions that are taking place across the country at the state and local level, right? And so I think, you know, we've seen even throughout the prior presidential administration, how being in Washington state in particular, how in some ways we were insulated from many of the facts um, because of the fact that, you know, our, our local, um, well, we've been such a blue state, right? And we have our, our local leadership um, really had very different ideologies and political aims than the national leadership. Wonderful, thank you. Let's see, our next question um, says, how can we change the zero sum game narrative? How can issues be framed and messaging be clear, like worker protections and wages, so that the voting public can see that a coalition of voters who elect BIPOC candidates can bring benefits across racial groups? No, I think that's, uh, I think that's really important, Asia, is how do, we, how do we best tell the story of how, once we elect our communities of color, into the floor of the people's house. Let's get an analysis of what bills are really changing based on the fact that we have a new voice that's being represented and being at the table making those decisions. And I think um, with that comes that conversation of hope. We are in by sharing the results of the HEAL Act, the Working Families, Ta the working families Tax Credit, of uh, the five incredible bills that the House Democratic and the Senate Democratic parties moving on public safety, um, the clear work that we're being done in early childhood development, the fact that the House Democratic caucus has taken the initiative that every bill that moves through must be looked at with equity and diversity. Um, I, I look at myself, I'll look at myself in the mirror and say, Deborah, how do you as a representative and a person of color best better tell that story out to our communities, our most vulnerable communities, in any way possible to say, you elected me and I'm making a difference. And this is how you're gonna see it when you open up your fridge, when you go to pay your light bill, when you go to the gas pump, when you send your daughter or your son to school, when your young, when your young boy of color runs out the door, you don't know what's going to happen to him and when he's gonna come home. Uh, that's what we need to be doing as a legislature is better telling our story so everyone will be excited to vote, uh, to be able to protest in a way, right, Angelique, that tells their story. I think we could be doing a better job. All right, our next question is how confident are you that the court system will help limit new voter suppression should some of the 160 plus proposed bills pass? Well, I am not very confident. And I think, um, you know, many legal commentators are feeling that way with the, at least the courts, um, but there are other, right, legislative, uh, movements in place. But of course, we know at the federal level, um, even with some bills moving forward uh, with the filibuster, it can be very difficult, you know, difficult for sweeping, you know, comprehensive voter reform to take place again for that legislation to be passed. Um, I think right now the courts are really, you know, if we look at what happened with uh, Justice Roberts and the Shelby case in 2013, we're looking at the current cases, they're really you know, bogged down in the minutiae and technicalities in a way that really 
um, doesn't impact real people, <laughs> right? Um, and in a way that really isn't focused on whether or not this is actually in effect, right? Um, harming people, they're really, I think, I think while they won't entirely gut the Voting Rights Act, um, they're going to allow and open the door for a lot more of these restrictive um, efforts at the state level. So there's a lot of work for us to do. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be difficult, but we absolutely need a um, another powerful uh, Voting Rights Act. You know, uh, Shelby versus Holder absolutely removed that Section Five which um, kind of put in place that new voter ID laws had to be cleared by the federal government. And as a result, we, see, we saw all these voter ID laws uh, be able to be put in place by states. And so it is, it is absolutely gonna be difficult, but what we've seen in terms of, you know, uh, historically, right? It's uh, ordinary people mobilizing, organizing to push back and that we certainly need another coalition of people to come together and demand and say, no, we want this law to be passed. And that's the political pressure that, you know, we can certainly um, help to build and encourage and also get, and another thing, we just gotta get young people also on board, right? They are absolutely critical to these movements in the past, you know? And I just wanna, you know, acknowledge that there are students here in Washington state um, that are undocumented, they, they qualify for DACA, but they can be part of that movement as well to help to change and reform so that later on when the uh, opportunities uh, come about so they can participate in electoral politics, politics they'll benefit from these uh, new voting uh, rights laws. And I think it's really important at this time uh, for us to support. So if you're looking for places to put your volunteer hours, if you're looking for places to put your dollars, to support organizations that are fighting these kind of voter suppression um, acts in the courts, such as the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. They have been a, a key organization that has worked in the last several years to try to stop many of these laws from being implemented. And so uh, supporting those organizations and other similarly situated organizations who fight these things is a very good use of your time. Um, whether you're, if you can't give any money to them, then promoting them on your social media accounts so that other people can be aware of them and understand the work that they're doing. Absolutely, thank you guys. Uh, let's see, our next question is, how do we break through the quote unquote, I only listen to one news source echo chamber to get facts about voter suppression to be heard? I'm just going to I'm just going to jump in this with one quick thought, which is just like Josue pointed out with, with the Shelby case, you know, the claim that if we open this door, we're in a different place and people will run through it. Actually, the moment the door was open, all these voter suppression laws passed, right, and, and state after state. Um, so the absence of federal restraint actually is similar with with what's happened with our media environment, which is in the early 80s under Reagan they got rid of the fair and balanced rule and encouraged the, you know, the, and, and encouraged people to engage in more and more partisan media. And, and the result is that, again, we need to remember that this happened at the moment we took away a regulation. Like it's not just technology, it's actually policy. And so it, just like voting suppression, like the media environment is a regulated environment and it has, we, we had a better environment and we now we have a worse environment and there's a law that changed that we can document where that change happened. So in a similar way, we need to think about what kinds of laws do we need to try to create a more stable media environment so that people are better and have better access to information. And it's it's almost as if it's, it's the lie. Uh, for four to six years, we've been told the media is the lie. Media is the lie. We, we, they, we, their integrity, uh, the intention of what and why we have news has been stripped. We need to reinvest back in them, reinvest back into uh, shaping the message, reinvest back into the integrity, uh, use the, uh, and then going back into technology just a little bit, Johan, um, our young ones live and breathe by 
all of our all of the technical uh, and social media, um, how do we take advantage of that and shape the messaging to where it really recognizes where we need to go in the future by advocating, uh, by getting the facts out, and by getting information out? Um, we need to reinvigorate and reinvent uh, the news and bring it back to what it was once again. I should get a good news story out of that one, right? I get two brownie points, right? Absolutely. You get your whole <laughs> front page piece. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I wanted to leave a few minutes here um, just to do a quick round table and have um, you know, everyone kind of say their last kind of two pieces before we wrap up kind of what, what would you want the audience to take away from this? Um, and if we could begin with Terry, uh, please. Sure. Um, and kind of going off of the last question as well. So, you know, don't be afraid to have converse conversations with family members, with neighbors that might be uncomfortable about um, some of the facts related to this. Make sure that you are informed. And so the best way, and I, I tell students and others who ask this all the time, the best way to be able to have conversations with people who have a certain uh, notion, a certain misconception of things is to be informed with the facts. So do your own research, understand what is occurring, understand the language and the intention with the voter suppression uh, laws and some of the lies that feed into that so that you can then go into those conversations and be okay with being uncomfortable and go into those conversations to be able to encourage people to see the truth, encourage people to vote, encourage people to protest and to contact their local officials and tell them their own thoughts. And don't forget that change can come. We've done it before. We can do it again. Thank you so much, Terry. Deborah, would you like to go next? I'd be happy to. Uh, thank you. Change does come. And thank you, Terry. That was a great line uh, to, to end our conversation with all of you. You know, there's great hope in Washington State. We have incredible people who are serving all of you every day. We're seeing laws that we've never seen before. I've heard voices on the people's floor and values and cultures that it wasn't there 20 years ago. Um, don't be afraid to stand up. Look for the change, identify the change, and find your place. Your voice matters. You matter. Get out and recognize and help others to vote. If you have a strong, um, a strong heart and a spirit on a certain particular topic, uh, Anjali, you're right. Get out and share your voice because that's what being an American is about. You know, I'm I am your I am your first American saying welcome to my America. Welcome to my America. Uplift and get the vote out. Remove those barriers. Advocate. Be strong. Uh, a little bit of hope to leave you guys with. We have redistricting coming up. It is going to be an enormous uh, decision-making in the state of Washington. Our redistricting for the first time has a Native American woman coming out of uh, the Yakima area, who's the chair, has a Native American man uh, who also sits on the board, has an incredible woman of color, uh, April Simmons, who's sitting on the board. The redistricting was predominantly one color, one gender, up until this year. And we have new change coming up in redistricting. We need to protect our communities and make sure that we advocate and our voice is there. There's hope, but you have to own that hope and you have to live up to it. And you gotta remove the barriers to get out to vote. And don't forget to run for office. Thank you, Asia. I love that. Thank you, Debra. Um, Angelique, do you mind going next? Sure, I want to build um, absolutely is hope, but I also want to add that we really need to continue these conversations that we've had. They've been going on for some time, but we're really reignited with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and the discussion of racism in our country and how we can deconstruct these systems. And I say that because when we think about voting, right, people often think about citizenship, belonging right in society. Um, but fundamentally, when we're talking about this polarization, who we're willing to listen to, it really goes even deeper when we think about ideas like the racial and the social contract of who do we even consider as human, right, in our society, like who is, right, how are we really focusing and valuing the fundamental humanity of everyone in our society as a, as a person, right? And, 
you know, I think this is something that's going to be crucial as we move forward because it's so easy to disenfranchise, to dismiss those that, right, are in, in many ways, we could argue the way many populations are treated in this country is less than human, right? And so I think that is something that as we continue these discussions, we continue, right, the hope and the movement forward is we have to keep engaging in these crucial conversations and not just give it lip service, but actually engage in meaningful change that changes the concrete situations and positionalities of people who have historically been oppressed. Because until then, it's going to be very difficult, right, for people to believe in this and to see this democratic experiment work. Absolutely, thank you, Angelique. And Josue, do you mind going next? Yes, absolutely. And you know, in all the classes that I teach, you know, I talked about race and uh, the different inequalities that's created. I also tell my students, but we also have to look at resistance, you know, to to, to that racism, you know. And as I studied. The Washington State voting rights movement, it was farm workers, it was campesinos who were organizing. It was students at the University of Washington who were coming from the Seattle into the Yakima Valley organizing this farm workers and they sought allies. They sought the American Civil Liberties Union and said, hey, we need your expertise. Uh, we don't know how to file this lawsuit, but can we tap into that knowledge? And so it was everyday folks that were organizing and mobilizing to push against uh, the discrimination and racism and, and, and those devices that were blocking them fr from the ballot, right? Uh, and in the words of uh, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, si se puede. Thank you so much, Josue. And of course, our wonderful moderator, Johan, would you please round us out with your closing thoughts? Oh, no, I don't think I have closing thoughts. Um, no, I'm joking. I want to first thank Mary's Washington. Um, for hosting this event. I want to thank Deborah for being here and for all your work um, representing the people of Washington. And I want to thank the three other panelists for sharing their wisdom with us. I think one thing that Josue said that, that really struck with me is the importance of local culture. And I guess what I'd say to the person who asked about the zero sum game, I think we need to, in a moment of such polarization, if we can find a way to start seeing each other, not as enemies, not as subhuman, but as fellow Americans. And we can find a way to say, this is not a zero sum game, that actually creating local cultures of democracy will filter up as well. Then we can start to revitalize our democratic experiment that is clearly in a state of crisis at the moment. And so I, I'm hopeful that we can try to do that. Thank you everyone for being here and thank you, Asia, for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Asia. Thank you, everyone. I'm very humbled to be a part of this and to have you guys here. Uh, thank you to all of our audience members for joining us um, on behalf of all of Wa Humanities Washington. Um, and I hope that everyone has a great night. Um, and I hope that this leaves you with a little bit of hope for us all. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank right. you, everybody. Good night, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.